Okay, so uh, my presentation is on multi myeloma. And so what is multi myeloma? Well, multi myeloma is one of the most common blood cell cancers in the US and in the world. It currently accounts for approximately 10% of all blood cell cancers in the US. It is biologically characterized by malignant plasma cells in the bone marrow secreting monoclonal proteins. And these secretions can cause a variety of different end organ damages, such as renal impairment. Um, a key trait of multiple myeloma is that it's extremely heterogeneous. And what that means is that one patient's multiple myeloma may be completely different from another patient's multiple myeloma. This variation between patients makes it extremely difficult to treat using traditional medicine. And this is why many experts, doctors, and scientists have been turning to personalized or precision medicine um, to help account for this variation. And they do this because precision medicine um, tailors medical treatment to a specific patient's characteristics, unlike traditional medicine. So how is multiple myeloma currently being treated? Well, three of the most common multiple myeloma treatments are targeted therapy, immunomodulatory drugs, and chemotherapy. Targeted therapy is therapy that is targeted at specific characteristics, uh, traits, or parts relating to a cancer. So for multiple myeloma, um, protosome inhibitors are one of the most common forms of um, targeted therapy. And what protosome inhibitors do is they work to inhibit the protosome section, the protosome enzyme of a cancer cell. And protosomes can be seen as a sort of garbage can for the cancer cell that um, degrades or gets rid of um, unneeded or damaged proteins. And by inhibiting these protosomes, protosome inhibitors can help uh, stop the growth, of the, stop or slow the growth of the cancer. And in regard to immunomodulatory drugs, um, these drugs work to, work to stimulate the immune system in a variety of ways, including um, stimulating antibody production or preventing blood vessels from growing that could help, that could be used to feed the cancer. And lastly, chemotherapy is the practice of using multiple rounds of drugs or chemicals to fight the spread of a cancer. In regard to multiple myeloma, chemotherapy is often used in conjunction with um, other therapies such as targeted therapy. So what do we currently know about multiple myeloma mutations? Um, four of the most common mutations in multiple myeloma are KRAS, NRAS, TP53, and FAM46C. And these are the four mutations that will be um, observed in the study. So KRAS and NRAS both play crucial roles in the MAPK slash ERK pathway, which primarily deals with cell regulation and cell proliferation. NRAS and KRAS code for the NRAS and KRAS proteins, respectively, and these can be seen as sort of molecular on and off switches for the pathway. So when a mutation does occur in the NRAS or KRAS gene, this can cause the molecular switch to be switched permanently on, which can lead to um, unregulated and uncontrolled cell proliferation. And this is a key step in the development of multiple myeloma and other forms of cancer. Um, TP53 codes for tumor protein 53, and the primary role of tumor protein 53 is to maintain genetic stability. And a mutation TP TP53 can lead to genetic instability, which can then um, lead to different forms of cancer. And lastly, as for FAM46C, there's still a significant level of ambiguity surrounding its, its exact function. However, some recent studies have pointed to the possibility that may play a role in uh, maintaining mRNA stability or tumor suppression. And the Compass data set forms the, the base data for the entirety of the study. Um, it's currently be con being conducted by the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation and about 1,150 patients um, across the world at 76 different sites are, cur are currently participating. And they are primarily from France, uh, the US, Italy, and Spain, but there are many, many other countries that are participating as well. Um, the data set keeps track of um, a variety of patient characteristics, such as uh, obviously gene mutations, uh, family history, height, age, race, et cetera. So what role do multiple myeloma mutations and treatments play in patient survival? Well, different multiple myeloma mutations won't have a significant effect on overall and progression-free survival of multiple myeloma patients. Furthermore, when subdivided for specific treatment lines, patients will not show a statistically significant difference in survival compared to a corresponding non-subdivided um, group. So moving on to the method. Well, the first step in the method of the study was to create groups, which um, are also known as cohorts, from the 1,150 multiple myeloma patients within the COMPASS data set. One wild type and one mutant cohort were created for each of the four different gene groups, which are NRAS, KRAS, TP53, and FAM46C. So that accounts for eight cohorts. And along with this, for the genes KRAS, NRAS, and TP53, 
the status of whether or not a patient received uh, borlazomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone first line treatment, which I'll uh, start calling borlandex, was also accounted for, and that created six extra groups. So all in all, 14 different unique groups or cohorts were created. The next step in the process was to create kaplan meyer survival curves to compare different cohorts over the entire 2,500-day time period that the patients were kept track of. Specifically, comparisons were focused on mutant and wild-type cohorts of the same gene and the survival between those cohorts. After that, hazard values and p-values were calculated for each of the kaplan meyer survival curve comparisons in order to help quantify the differences um, in survival observed between different cohorts of the same gene. Um, hazard values are a comparison between the probability events in a treatment group versus the probability events in a control or non-treatment group. And lastly, each kaplan meyer survival curve comparison was examined for statistical significance um, based on the p-values and hazard values over the entire 2500-day time period. However, in certain circumstances where major fluctuations in survival were observed for some curves, um, so the time period was subsetted to help uh, bring attention to any major differences in survival that may uh, have occurred during certain specific time periods. So moving on to results. Over here with the mutant KRAS patients, it was observed that they had a lower overall survival compared to their wild type KRAS counterparts. In fact, patients in the mutant KRAS group were 21.82% more likely to experience an event, in this case, that would be death, and were 8.41% more likely to see their disease progress um, at any point in time compared to the control group. And this is especially notable since these same types of uh, observations were not observed within the NRAS mutation groups, despite the relation between the, the genes. And then over here with TP53, um, similar to the KRAS gene groups, the mutant TP53 patients also saw a significant decrease in overall and progression-free survival compared to their wild-type patients. And then lastly, when subsetted for the first-line treatment or Landex down here, no patient group showed a statistically significant um, difference in survival over the entire 2,500-day 20, time period. However, from certain time, time periods, major fluctuations were observed and p-values were calculated. So for example, from days uh, 1,300 to 2,500, Mutant TP53 patients did see lower overall survival compared to their wild type counterparts. And as well as for KRAS, um, mutant KRAS patients from the days 1800 to days 2100, they also saw lower overall survival compared to uh, their wild type counterparts. And then moving on to the discussion. So, based on the results, KRAS and TP TP53 clearly correlated with much lower overall survival than their wild type counterparts thus rejecting the initial hypothesis, hypothesis that there would be no correlation or effect. However, it is really a note that the results do not imply a definite um, cause and effect relationship in a clinical setting. In order to determine such a relationship, um, a study that accounts for a wide variety of confounding variables would have to be conducted, and such a study to be co conducted within patients would likely be quite difficult since there's a lot of variation within patients. And as well, KRAS and TP53 also all initially followed the survival trends of the patient um, data set as a whole until they both dropped off severely in survival in overall survival rate at days 1500 and days 400 respectively. And a possible explanation of this is that the effects of these mutations are not fully realized until um, certain points in time. In regard to the effects of borderline dex as a first line treatment, for mutant TP53, the steep decline in overall survival occurred later in the borderline dex TP53 group than it did in the regular TP53 group that was not subsetted for Borlandex. And the opposite was true for the KRAS gene groups. So this suggests that Borlandex uh, may, be quite a, may be a quite effective treatment for patients with the TP53 mutation, while it may not be as effective for patients um, with the KRAS mutation. However, further studies can definitely be conducted to help solidify this correlation and relationship between Borlandex and these mutations. Um, so in conclusion, the results of the study yield many important implications for the possible effects of common multimyeloma mutations and overall progression-free survival. Specifically, that KRAS and TP53 um, correlate with substantially correlate with significantly low overall and progression-free survival. And this study has also introduced many new understandings on the effects 
of using Boral Index on certain patients with different mutations. Um, specifically, TP53, um, Boral Index did not work as well, and KRAS, I mean, it did work very well, and then KRAS, it did not work as well. So these implications can play a significant understanding in our understanding of risk factors in multi-myeloma patients and how to tailor medical treatment to these risk factors. And then finally, some limitations of the study include um, not being able to fully account for all the confounding variables such as age, height, um, race, family history, et cetera. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Justin, as you know, you've had an opportunity to prepare for these oral defense questions, and I will be asking you one from each category, the research process, your depth of understanding, and reflection on your inquiry process. And my first question for you is, how did your initial exploration of the scholarly conversation lead to your final research question? Yeah, good question. So um, my initial exploration focused a lot on looking at risk stratification for multiple myeloma um, and other cancers as well as other diseases. So that led a lot to my uh, research process and um, method, a lot of my research question focusing on the, the genetic factors of multiple myeloma and how these risk factors can play a role. Oh, you're muted, Amanda. You're right, I am. Thank you. Uh, you also, you mentioned um, a little bit about how research in the future could be done to kind of further the understanding of this area. So I was wondering, could you tell me a little bit more about how your findings provide direction for research in the field? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, um, the research established correlation. And um, I mean, given the circumstances this year, cause and effect relationship that controlled for many confounding variables was uh, hard to determine. So I guess in the future, future researchers could, you know, work to establish more of these, to account for more of these confounding variables to help establish um, a stronger cause and effect relationship. And the final question that I have for you, Preston, is um, what is the most important research skill that you developed as a result of this process and how might you apply that to future endeavors? So I would say the most important research skill that I've developed during this process is um, learning how to better ask the right questions along my research um, process. And I don't mean just asking the correct research question. Uh, that obviously is important, but being able to ask the right questions along the way. So in this study, for example, um, it was questions like, how can I, what, val what statistical um, values would best help me um, get my point across with the data I have? Or how can I most efficiently organize the data? And questions like that, I feel like, um, and asking, being able to ask questions like that really helped uh, me along this process. Great, well, that is the end of the formal part of your presentation with oral defense.